Собственно, в завершении нашего парковка «Точка движения», которая была посвящена теме «Город как закрытая открытая система». Мы, собственно, пригласили Мнеля Хименес Гарсия к нам. Получили от него очень интересное мнение. Действительно, наш проект просили его еще, собственно, прочитать лекцию. Мнель является преподавателем архитектурной ассоциации и ведет такой исследовательский кластер в магистратуре, который называется Design Research Lab. Также он преподает в школе Bartlett в Лондоне. И также он является основателем студии MD, MAD Design. Даю ему слово. Название его лекции «Flex Book Invitation» гибкое программирование, скажем так. Спасибо. Спасибо, Катя, за приглашение и за приглашение. Я не понял ничего, конечно, но я думаю, что это было потрясающе. Это было потрясающе для меня приглашать здесь, в Строке. Спасибо всем организациям организации. Это было потрясающе для меня and to getting me here, so thank you very much. Uh, I hope to give a good lecture. Um, well, um, I guess uh, Kathy already said that, but uh, my name is Manuel Jimenez, um, and I'm, I'm an architect. I'm also an educator, I, I teach at the AA and at the Barnet, and I'm a spouse. Um, I think that's really important, maybe you don't notice if you don't uh, speak English, but I have a huge Spanish accent, so you would actually get to know that. Um, but it's also important for something else. Uh, this is uh, Antonio Gaudi's Sagrada Familia, uh, which is continued now uh, with the work of uh, Mark West, uh, which has been fantastic. It's been one of the, the first buildings uh, using uh, uh, digital computation. Um, and it was re a real reference for me. I always started the lecture with that image uh, because that's the reason why I started that. Um, I was really passionate by the idea of the, of the prototype, and how Gaudi wrote a kind of a new, new Gothic cathedral and transformed it completely, kind of hybridized it into something else. Um, and I was, I was really intrigued by the, the idea of a structure that could kind of perform in different ways and that, that could create a space. This is Calatrava, he's also Spanish. And he is an engineer as well as an architect, and he's really using the structures for creating space. Um, so I was really attracted by these two guys. Uh, but when I when I started architecture, I realized they were not really uh, that hollow. Uh, but instead, this was the the, the stuff that, that we were kind of taught in the in the school, which is great. I love Campo Baeza. I think he's he's an amazing architect and an amazing professional. Uh, but I, I kind of disagree with the aestheticism of the model. I think it was, it was to kind of pre-design and not really leaving the door open for anything to happen, rather to just the designer mind and the blueprint. Uh, so I, was, um, I started kind of uh, investigating about this topic of getting something that is not really just preconceived and um, built, but it's actually something that a mechanism that could evolve and that could change and that could accommodate new conditions coming from somewhere else that is maybe not the design. Uh, so this is the work of John Fraser. Um, he did this amazing research at the AA and he called it a, an evolutionary architecture and it was a, about a, getting these mechanisms to actually uh, build complex structures through the interaction between them. Um, so, without even having the tools or any kind of uh, computational uh, background, um, I started trying to represent these, these ideas and to, to control this kind of evolving systems. Um, so, I got this, this kind of urban plot to do my final thesis project. Um, I, didn't know, I didn't know what to do with it because I didn't really have so much information. So I try to get just a few points and try them to uh, get them to interact. So kind of transmit information from one to another and generate different new, new points and new clusters. 
Uh, this was the result of it. I was really criticized because uh, people wanted me to just create a building in a corner. And I, I said, look, I'm not really building this whole mass. I'm just kind of anticipating what could happen in a few years. And maybe someone else comes and say, look, this didn't happen. It was something, something different. But we cannot leave the door open for that evolutionary process. Uh, the building was actually established the same way, so it was a dynamic structure that could evolve and could accommodate different dimensions. So uh, we can get this uh, huge cantilever for the main auditorium, uh, 45 meters, uh, but you could also kind of expand into, into more uh, like smaller spaces, like office spaces, and it could really easily accommodate a new branch and connect to a new building or even generate a new building by its own. Um, so uh, with that, that was the, let's say, my, my last step in, in Madrid, and then I, I went to London. And I created this thing with Maria, who is a hair designer, really talented. Um, we created this called Madden Design, or a medium. Uh, and it was actually based on uh, the passion that we had for nature and for structures. So, okay, you, you can't really hear the song. Uh, it doesn't really matter. Um, this is um, the 3,000 3, radiolarian species. I'm going through it in a video, and, and on the right, we have a nervous system uh, talking about actually replicating this behavior from the coding perspective. Uh, so trying to get algorithms that could generate uh, self-organizing structures. Um, so that idea was really related to, to my Spanish background, uh, really based on structure, structures and tectonics, uh, and really coming back to the idea of backing this fuller and, and kind of get to, to, to control kind of uh, basic, basic and really primitive structures uh, to perform in different ways. Um, so I started researching in, in have all these systems and agent-based systems uh, to create different structures, to, to kind of expand, to, to get form from different points, to bifurcate. Uh, this was just sketches, really, but uh, it was really targeted towards the creation of different structures with different resolutions uh, that eventually could get combined and to form a kind of a multi-scalar organism. Um, so these are some of the results. These are just kind of a, a few formal sketches to, to kind of get to, get to participate in the creation of algorithmic structures. Um, then, uh, well, the lecture is kind of combining a little bit of, of myself as a student and a little bit of uh, right after when I created my practice and what I've been doing through these years, uh, but also what I've been, uh, when I've been collaborating with other people um, and kind of freelancing and and participating in, in a, a few really interesting projects. So uh, this, this is uh, for a practice called Minima Forms. Uh, it's run by Theodore and, and the Stephen Spearholders. And it was about creating interactive design. This is just a sketch, really, for Channel 4. Uh, but it was about how to combine interactive design with a structure formation or merging. Uh, so we can get different parameters that could get controlled by people kind of communicating with, it, with this device, and this device would react in different ways, but always be instructed. Um, these are some of the results. Uh, this will get into a documentary in, in Channel 4, it will be out soon. Uh, then I collaborated as well with uh, this practice called La Nayan de Ostos, uh, with um, my really good friends, uh, Ricardo de Ostos and Nanay Jakoski. Uh, and we did this installation for Files of Paulo in, in Brazil. Uh, it was amazing. It, this was amazing. We were the only architects in there. This is a really famous festival, uh, mainly for art, and they gave us the entrance. Um, and because we are architects, we needed to build something. We couldn't just stop in the, in the interaction or in the, in the virtual world. And we were really fascinated with this idea of, uh, of a mutuality that was happening and was kind of increasing its value uh, within the, the medium class society in, in Sao Paulo. So they are starting kind of uh, getting uh, more, more gadgets and, and consuming more information, consuming more internet, and actually generating more data. And we were interested in expressing that idea in a physical manner. Um, so we kind of developed that, that virtual layer that could get overlap to this physical layer and that could influence, influence each other. 
so these are the two of them interacting, and this is the real object. When we design this device, um, kind of overlapping both structures. So it is recording and it's looking at the, the physical structure, but then when people go through it, uh, you can see how uh, these people get tracked. Um, we use Microsoft Connect for that, and get tracked, and it influences the behavior of the digital layer that is uh, overlapping. So you have uh, these kind of two visions of the real world. One is that the one that you really see, and the other one is the one that is really hidden by its layers, but that you kind of know that this is there and is participating with you. Um, in a similar similar kind of concept, um, coming back to minima phones, um, we developed this project. This is a really long-term project, but the last stage was for for MoMA Museum in, in New York. Um, it was really interesting. Um, it was about you know, testing testing people and what will happen when they communicate with a virtual layer. Um, so the, the small points there in the screen, or the, the kind of the small dots, uh, they are representing people wearing a mask that we design, and we actually see it at MoMA. And the, the three big heads uh, are the big couple, and they have its own behavior. Um, but then people interact with them, and then the dogs get excited, uh, they get sad, they get bored of you, and the challenge was to observe how people will respond to this interaction by the media. Um, we evolved this, this project in something that we, uh, we call the pet, pet zoo. Um, so this is more about generating a mechanism, like really doing this physical. Um, we created these robots. It was an amazing experience. Uh, we worked together with, uh, with Apostolis Despotidis, who was, was great in the whole process. And he was focusing on the robots. Um, we got to actually negotiate people with machines, but not just in a really kind of one-to-one -one behavior when you move to the right and then the machine follows, and then you move to the left and the machine follows again. Uh, but instead, the machine has its own behavior. So if you really move too much to the, uh, to the right, and the machine can, can get bored of you and could react and could even hit you or could stop and, and, and be really kind of just, just a boring pet. Right? Um, so this was really interesting, and we were playing this, this continuous feedback between the physical prototype, I'm just going to skip through it because it could be quite long, um, and how we can uh, control it digitally, but also how we can uh, simulate the larger behavior with a larger organization. So what would that mean if instead of having three pets, we will have 300, and, and they, they kind of uh, behave together? So these are some of the experiments. Uh, we did, this, is, this is quite nice. Um, we got a, like a digital head paired with a, with a physical head. So you could see how the robot is, is reacting to you, but also how the virtual head is, is uh, communicating with you and you see yourself in the screen. So it was kind of a really nice experience. Okay, I'm just going to skip through it a little bit. Um, okay, as I, as I said, the lecture is going to be a little bit of uh, practicing and a little bit of teaching. Uh, this is the teaching part. Um, I teach at the, at the Barlet in, in a diploma unit, uh, which is the, uh, it's called Phantom 18, it's the diploma 18, uh, together with Nanette and Ricardo. And it's been a great experience. This is some of the things that we've, we've been researching uh, in these last few years, especially this, this last year. It's a pity that we don't have, we don't have song for this one. Um, was, uh, especially we don't have, um, they both talking about what's happening, but they talk about the, un the unexpected algorithm. Like something that you can pre-program. So he created his world. Uh, this is uh, the movie Tron, which is amazing. If you haven't seen it, you need, you need to run right now out of the lecture and, and go to see it. It's way better than me. Um, so this guy uh, created a virtual world and generated people out of algorithms. But the, the, the really kind of interesting part happened when the unexpected actually took place. So you program a part, but then the, uh, the, the organism, this, this kind of uh, machine that you put it together and you highly control, starts to operate in its own way and to generate its own algorithms and its own, uh, its own almost genotype. And so in, in this sequence, which is called uh, Fixing LoRa, He's finding the, the wrong code, 
And now uh, Laura is going to get me started. There you go, I skip to it. Yeah, so he kind of uh, get that information out of his body and then the body recompose. Um, so we were really interested in this idea, but not almost from that, spe that perspective of actually taking information out, but taking information into matter. And how would matter react when you kind of pull a, view, a virus through it, through its body, and how it, it can start being formed. So the unit was about coupling uh, Max Ernst together with Alan Turing, uh, who is the creator of the first digital computer. So how we can get an expected real natural nature based on code and the evolution of algorithms. Um, we were also really interested, like this is, this is more or less, this is another reference, uh, it's kind of reflective what we, we wanted to kind of get, uh, that these really normal objects, that when they get in contact with information, they create weird physical parts into their body. Okay? So we call this metamorphosis. Um, so this is the work of some of the students. Uh, this is Nasius. Uh, he created his own alphabet. So uh, each of these guys is a word. Um, and then he got to actually evolve it and to create paragraphs. So the project was about how to uh, get people, people's conversation in the space and translate it into paragraphs, uh, which creates phrases. So the, the whole space is actually a story that gets developed. Um, so it was, it was actually really interesting. We got also Anthony doing this uh, casting process with concrete, and so playing with different form work, uh, like using inflatables, using SDLs, being in the, in the really kind of high, highly controlled framework, but also then going for a really smooth process. Um, he also created his language. Well, it was more actually that he focused on languages that has been created and analyzed them. So the first, the first wall, the one in the left, here, um, is representing a pure language, uh, which is the brick wall, right? This was English. And then the second one is uh, starting the insertion of a new language, which was Spanish, and this is a real case. So he did, did, did research uh, about the creation of Spanish. That is something I really get to know. Uh, so the, the kind of the, the, the last ones are close to Spanglish when it's uh, actually combining both them. And this is some, some, some of his results where we get to see really different and weird stuff within our walls that is actually coming from the abstraction of different information into math. Uh, we also got students like Adam, uh, who at the same time MIT was developing this uh, SLS 3D printer, really high cutting edge technology. Uh, we got Adam in a garage, um, just with a couple of lasers and, uh, and a MacBook, uh, just projecting into resin and creating his own really low tech 3D printer. And he got these kind of results with the resin. Uh, we also use simulation, that we do it a lot in both schools. You will get to see uh, some part of the AA right after. Um, we use simulations to control the material, but actually for, for understanding the material properties and being able to anticipate what will happen in the large scale. So Adam was actually um, trying to see what would happen with his mechanism if instead of being in the garage, he would actually create a huge pavilion or even create something like uh, moving into towards architectural scale. Uh, this is the DRL Data Sign Resource Lab. I teach there together with uh, Theodore Spiopoulos, um, Sajid Busam, and Mustafa Al Sayed. Um, so, this was the result of the studio last year. I'm going to show a couple of projects. It's actually based on a similar, similar kind of process. Um, this is called Rio. It's uh, Christian Fotini, Denis, and Lee. They did this, this amazing project based on 3D printing. Uh, so, this is 3D printing, but not in a conventional manner when you uh, design an object and then use 3D print, but actually tweaking it, tweaking the 3D printer, and, and get the, the G code to actually evolve by itself. They started with really uh, basic material studies, and then they move uh, to the digital computation. So we always have this feedback loop, uh, this feedback uh, loop between the, the, the physical and the simulation in the digital world. So one can actually inform the other. Uh, they were dealing with the uh, uh, particle, uh, uh, particle spinning systems. 
So it's really kind of physically controlling, uh, simulating gravity and stuff like that. This, this was one of the first stages of this printing, uh, their printing process. Uh, so they were kind of feeding the, the machine, not really from a top-down perspective, but actually generating these ledgers that were really directly connected with the structure. So they were deploying it in, let's say, in a, in a real-time sequence. So you get to print the ledger, then the second ledger, but you don't know how the last ledger is going to be. And this was the physical result. Um, so the, pro the whole project was uh, trying to, to rethink about that typology. In this case, it's, the, it's just a column, uh, but from a really structural point of view. So they were connecting this uh, structural analysis uh, continuously with the, with the material uh, creation and with the digital simulation. Um, so we get to actually create an efficient structure. The material will be deployed slower, and you uh, need to support more, more loads, uh, so it gets to blend it, uh, within each other. Uh, and then it will be faster, so it creates these, these threads that you see when you really uh, don't have uh, uh, so much effort for the structure. Uh, this is another project, it's called Syntax Error. Um, uh, it's <coughs> to me, Constantino, Sara, and Bisu. Uh, they, they started researching about quadrocopters. Um, they use this uh, AI drone, that for sure you, you know already, you can control it with the iPhone, but because you can control it with the iPhone, you can basically control it with anything else, uh, using Bluetooth. Um, so they hacked into the drone, trying to not just be controlled by a person, but actually getting their own behavior and getting to recognize it. So there's a, a really nice sequence here, so here. So when they, they get to see face to face, it looks almost like a, you know one of these movies when uh, you know Star Wars uh, they are gonna fight with the with the laser sword, uh, and they, they recognize and they avoid each other. So it was really really cool that actually uh, these robots were interacting between themselves. So it was our first step towards real physical alien based systems. Um, and they train them to generate actions. So uh, because they can recognize each other and they can follow different choreographies, they can weave a structure in space. So if they carry threads, these threads can be deployed and then an, uh, another robot could come and solidify with the team. But in this case, it was formed. Um, so again, these are some of their, their algorithms for, for controlling the behavior that was always structurally stable and that you can get to to build larger structures with a larger population of robots. And then kind of the code Okay, this is, um, this is my, my thesis project. Uh, well, it started being my thesis project at the DRL back in 2009. It was about Harvard Pongo. I'm going to explain uh, in a minute. Uh, it was a project driven by Theodore Spiopoulos uh, and in collaboration between uh, Stella, Claudia, Roberto, and myself. Um, yeah, I said it started as a thesis project and, and kind of put it together some of our interests and then it kind of diverged into different directions that I will, I will explain afterwards. It was uh, based on the idea of uh, catenary structures and uh, really looking at Gaudi as a way of, of actually using analog computation to, to see how the, load, the, the loads could create a structure so you kind of flip it and then you, you have a structure that is working in pure compression. Um, so this is how he obviously operated in, in his uh, Sagrada Familia. And we coupled him with Mark West. Uh, Mark West is doing this amazing research about the architectural components using fabric, uh, using fabric foam. So we said, okay, what happens if we actually get to build uh, catenary structures using fabric foam, uh, which is uh, easy to build, is, is really um, rapid, uh, uh, rapidly deployed, and, and we can control it with really low-tech parameters like pressure points. We can maybe just stitch. And so the first part of the project is almost just about the stitching. And how we kind of control the pattern, so if it is uh, evenly distributed, then you will get uh, equal thickness in, in the whole structure, right? But in the image of the right, uh, if you make a gradient, then uh, the bottom part will get filled with more material 
and the part where the, where the points are really, really close to each other, the material wouldn't really expand. So the thickness would be, uh, it, it would be thin. The structure would be thin. These are the results of uh, some of the, some of the, the physical casting. These are the castings themselves. But we introduced um, a new idea here, uh, which was connecting uh, surfaces one to another. So when you put the material, uh, the material will go through the first surface and then come to the second surface. So therefore, if we operate with single surfaces, but then we stitch them together in order for the material to flow between them, we will get a continuous structure. So this, this was the result of, the, of the, some of them. Um, so we get to, to fold the structures and to connect the structures in different ways and develop different uh, connection points where the material could go through, when it's just a uh, heating or a different kind of behavior. Um, and then we couple it with the, with the digital simulations. So if we get to know how the material will perform in the computer, we don't really have to stitch anything, we don't need to build a physical prototype because we built it already, we got that information, now we can implement it and build the, the prototype that is actually evolved already. Um, so this was some of it, and then kind of using agent-based systems to find the, the pressure points, so we get like the, the, the pulling points or the, the supports with less stitching points and then accumulating in the center, and also deploying the material within the, inside the fabric. Uh, so we need to see the, uh, the expansion of the, of the actual digital fabric, uh, so we know that the casting process is gonna be successful. And uh, we couple that with a, with a script that would transmit the information so we will have a continuous feedback between the object and the structure analysis. Um, so as I explained at the, at the beginning, uh, the pattern is influencing the thickness of the structure. So the denser you have the pattern, the, the thinner the structure is going to be, and vice versa. So if we connect that to a structure analysis, we can say where we need points uh, to get more thickness or less thickness. So the structure is always stable. And we discover that uh, some of the points, we don't, we don't really need pressure points. So we don't really need uh, thickness there. We can leave it as empty, empty, empty pieces of light. We can connect a new surface and then custom faces. So this is basically explaining that idea where you uh, build a surface and then you cast, you connect the second one when the first one is already dry, and then you can connect it and fill the pocket of the first one. This explains the process. So we go from the physical model to the low resolution and then to the, the pattern control by the structural analysis and then you can unfold it, put it in a box, and send it out on site, and cast it. Um, and that kind of introduced the, the third and last pattern. Uh, that was again back to the idea of the catenary, but from a really computational point of view. So if we get the, the basic points of the structure, we can create a catenary structure that follows with it, and then driven by agent-based systems, we can get them to combine and to create larger structures. Maybe here it's much more clear. So you have a really simple way of connecting the structures. That's uh, by the uh, But then if you connect the borders of them, they can create continuous structures. But even if when you connect, you leave these, po these points up, you create not only longer structures, but actually larger spans. Uh, so you, you get a multi-scalar system within a dynamic process. Uh, we made different scenarios, and this was the, the first one we tested. Um, so it kind of combines the, the, the basic principles for having a, a kind of a basic space creation. Uh, this is the first layer, then we, get, uh, we find the, the points where the second layer could be attached to, and then those, reach those points and connect, so that's the same mistake. Um, we go to, we run a simulation, so we control the pattern of it, and we see what could be the result, especially. Yeah. So you can see it has like different scales, like a, a kind of a, a 
access plan combined with the really small spaces, it has ramps, it has all kind of sort of architectural parameters. And this was the fabrication. So we got that information because it's, it's based on, on the surfaces. You can separate them back and unfold them, stitch them, cast them in different places. And this is the result. Uh, it was nice to see the comparison between the, the result of the pure digital simulation, that is the image on the top, and then the image below is the, is the, the physical process. So it is a huge model, it's like two meters long, and it's really heavy. Uh, it took like 10 people to move, 10 people to move. Um, so then we ran the simulation just tweaking um, the algorithms, into following different local rules. Like in this case, when they connect, this is a simple tweak in the code. When they connect, they can actually get to a span over three times their, uh, their size. So they can create large spans. So it could be adapted to a different scenario, or more of an auditorium or a big cell. And then we did um, exactly the opposite. When they connect, they contract. So they, they get these really kind of small spaces combined and they even climb on top, so it becomes really dense structure. This is the output of it. Um, actually, this was the, the, the last image, and it was really nice to, to see the, the comparison with the, with the very first reference that we had, that was Gaudi. And then now people kind of see the stuff and say, oh, you are the new Gaudi, I, I wish. Um, I'm definitely not. But it's, it's good to actually see how these concepts carry through. And this was actually really successful in that sense. It, it was exhibited in the, in the uh, uh, Royal Academy and in Acadia, and people kind of really understood that process of abstracting information from the catenary system and, uh, and connect it to a fabric forward process. Um, it brought us into uh, two directions. Uh, one is more into the uh, collaboration world, so I, I, I did this collaboration with Theo. Um, about a, a casting doll. So getting the most simple structure that we can get, but actually controlling the pattern, not only for the pressure points and for the thickness of the structure, but also for the choreography of the material being put. So uh, we distributed these, these nodes, these um, nodes for actually pulling the material from. So you can go from pouring concrete from the bottom and then going up. This is the result of the, of the digital simulation. And this is the physical of uh, We obviously didn't, didn't build the whole dome. We didn't have budget for that. But we built this piece. It's now exhibited in, in Prague. It's going to open in September. So it's, it's going to be the best show ever. If you want to uh, go to see it, I think it will be definitely worth it. We exhibit a couple of pieces. Um, and then we, we thought about, okay, now we have the basic dome, and we feel pretty confident we can build it, but what would happen if this dome would evolve and would combine with different domes and create larger structures? So this was the case. We started uh, simulating what would happen with, with, uh, when these domes come together and, and create kind of continuous structures. So these are different ways of approaching that. Uh, if we get them to be created and then how do they find the boundaries, and how do they communicate with, him, with each other uh, for generating a, a global cast, or even if you are going to cast it in, in different stages. So you get to class one cast, uh, to class one cluster, but then after a few years, then you want to uh, augment that space and generate a new cast. Um, uh, we even thought about what will happen with a, with a larger community of domes. Uh, so they get to, to build a, a much larger uh, population. And we got different, different scenarios. Um, so this, uh, the image of the, of the left is actually represented uh, different, different ways of actually tweaking the code so it, it reacts to different environments and therefore it generates uh, different uh, special proposals. And this is the, the, the second thread, let's say. Uh, I said the research runs into two sides. Uh, this is the second one, uh, which is more uh, our own, like, together with, with Robert, 
we are um, we are trying to build our thesis project basically. Let's pull this again. Uh, based on the idea of an inflatable system. So this is an inflatable forward. Uh, this is a video by Dante Bini. They put the inflatable, then they put the concrete on top with the river, they inflate, and the, the dome pops up. So it's an amazing process, and they build more than 100 uh, domes over the wall. Um, so it's a really kind of uh, tested idea. Um, and we thought about using that idea, but within our, our pattern, so we get to inflate it and therefore um, kind of in, almost like invert gra uh, gravity. So we can simulate with the gravity inverted and then go inside this inflatable forward and pop the structure up. Um, so we are also talking with this guy. He's uh, one of our main references. This uh, called uh, Miguel de Radapu. He was one of these, these kind of crazy people dealing with inflatables and actually just not doing top-down design by, by getting a couple of inflatables, going on site, get the community there, and get it to interact and to create larger structures. So these are not just the architects, not the designers, not the builders. This is everybody working together to get the project built. And I thought that was really interesting. I will explain a uh, while. Uh, so this is basically some of the sketches that we, we get to a potential client. Uh, well, the, this is actually really happening. Uh, it's in Spain, so it's a market. They gave us. They were really interested in the in the project and in how low cost and efficient could be. And they gave us this side, this really long street that they want to cover with the surface. Um, so it's a really kind of long and narrow, but it needs to also be communicated at a, in a, some transversal kind of streets. So it was it was really difficult to get the mechanism. I put the star from both sides and then get to know each other in the middle and generate a physical structure. So this computationally was a, was a real challenge. Um, and we kind of put these edges uh, that could ne negotiate their behavior and their relationships. So they get communicating between themselves but creating a structure. And then once they, they, fi they find an application solution for being able to actually create a um, particle spin um, based structure, uh, uh, you can run the simulation with a simulated gravity, and then get the pattern to be generated. So get these, these points to be read it and to be translated to a structural um, analysis. This was the, this is the first result. Um, it's still too big, so we need to make it a bit smaller. Uh, but this is the, the, let's say the, the, the first sketch. Uh, but the, the workflow is already done, so we, we can get um, two points to uh, start with, to kind of communicate between themselves, find a common ground, generate a structure, and be a structure instead. So these are some of the interviews. Okay, this is the last thing I, I want to show. Uh, this is obviously not mine. Uh, this is the Petit Prince. And I was really obsessed with this idea uh, since I was a kid. I don't know why, but someone gave me this book. I think it was my mom or something. And I kept reading it day by day over almost a year. So I don't know what happened to it. And I was really obsessed. I was not an actor. I was just a kid. Uh, I was really obsessed with this idea. So it, it's been always on the back of my mind. Is this, a, is this a hat or is this snake eating, a, eating an elephant? Um, and I thought, okay, let's, let's investigate. So let's try to get something that people see from far and they think it's a hat, but then it's really an elephant. But the elephant is playing with the, uh, with the snake. Uh, so it, it's not just starting. Uh, starting. So I got to know this guy. Um, this is amazing. Um, I don't want to talk too much in this video. I think it's really cool. Uh, this is Sebastian Ramirez and, and Rafael Hildebrand. And they run this performance called Together Alone, where they, they, you don't really know what's happening, but you see there is a body within another body that is flexible, this is the puppet. Uh, and you slowly, kind of, your mind slowly recognizes some parts of that body, 
through this transformation and they do get to know what is really happening, what is inside the heart. that is influencing another material and is, is pulling, is, is transforming it, is behaving it in certain ways, and it's actually creating a structure. Um, also like Tara Donovan and, and how a membrane is not just a continuous kind of piece of fabric pulled from a couple of points, but it's actually uh, built from the minute, from the particles, from, from the edges, kind of interacting within themselves. So uh, this was a really nice structure that she did uh, just, just kind of put it together in small pieces. A lot of work, by the way. Um, so we came up with this idea. Um, this is more of the future. Uh, this is a workshop I'm, I'm running in, in September. Um, we are still kind of finding the last application, so if you are interested, you can call. Uh, it's with the IA, so it's an IA visiting school, and it's for exploring some of these principles. Um, the idea was to get the workshop divided into two. We got a, a, a really good commission for a pavilion at the same time as, as the workshop. And it's explaining the same idea. So on one hand, we're developing this application uh, that will be, will be given uh, to the students. So hopefully they do amazing stuff with it. I'm implementing it right now, but this is just an example. Uh, so they can get to play. This is processing based. They can play with the, with the structures but from a really kind of uh, the point of view of the particles. So how can you pinch the structure, or how can you actually generate a pattern in the structure? Um, so it's, it's in this case, it's uh, kind of coupling uh, structural and spring-based systems with uh, agent, agent behavior. So we are implementing it so people who uh, know code, uh, they, can, they can actually implement the code, so the application is free, it's open. It's open source, uh, and if you don't know how, you can actually deal with the structure and, and think through the project. So the idea is basically to do to couple prey also on a really kind of engineering point of view with a jellyfish. Um, so it is a strong, uh, a strange marriage. But yeah, I thought, what about if we get in this really uh, engineeringly controlled structure? What about if we get a lot of permutations? that we kind of get lost into the pattern and, and, and the, the physicality of the structure comes not from the global form, but actually from the small pieces. Um, so if we are inside a, a kind of a, a multi-layer fabric, what will happen? Will it be something like this? This is what we kind of explore in the pavilion. So this is the pavilion part. It will get built during the workshop, during a couple of days of the workshop, so it's, it's going to be really good. Uh, students are going to be able to, to kind of participate in it and see the process. Uh, so it is, a, it is a, a fabric within another fabric, like, a, like the snake and the, and the, the elephant. Uh, so this is just a few sketches um, about how to kind of hang one from the other and then cover it with something else. And then weird stuff will happen. This is just a sketch of uh, how these uh, kind of permutations and metamorphosis will happen in one layer when you get to know the other. So these are some of the simulations. Uh, we can digitally control how much the springs should be poor. So if we just um, build the structure, uh, and then we just have the fabric hand, we can control them digitally. Another view. So we know the result before running the physical space. Mm 
this is an external fabric that can deal in different ways with the, with the current contract. We can generate these kind of area formations. Uh, we are doing it in, in collaboration with Philips, uh, so we actually are going to have the, this really interactive lighting to happen. So this is a sketch of that. Let's see, let's see what comes out. And that's it. So thank you very much. Thank you. I hope it wasn't too long. Скажите, Алсана, всю комментарий это процессинг или еще программа? Ну, допустим, проект, где вы моделировали, где вы моделировали арки, сосающие, которые наполняли этот бетон. Based uh, like uh, agent-based systems in processing, coupled with uh, physical simulation, also in processing, using a library called Toxic Leaves by Custom Smith, who is amazing, by the way. You should check out the work. Um, so that's how it all started with the processing simulations. Afterwards, we moved that into Rhino. Uh, the result of the, the surfaces, we move it into Rhino, and we link Rhino with Algor, which is a structural analysis software. Um, we got this feedback loop uh, that was used in Grasshopper for Rhino, for generating the pressure points. Then it was moved to Maya. Yeah, it was long, eh? I'm, I'm gonna stay here a couple of hours. Um, what's that what's it? Um, so then we move it into Maya. We uh, got the fabric created in Maya. And we run an uh, inflation uh, simulation. Then we move it into Cinema 4D and we render it. And then we put it in a PowerPoint. That was long. <laughs> Спасибо за лекцию. У меня такой вопрос. Мы, будучи на этом воркшопе, достаточно много обсуждали сложившуюся интересную ситуацию, что вы в архитектурной ассоциации делаете крайне интересные вещи. И Роб приезжал, показывал тоже очень крутые проекты. А, но кроме как на таких лекциях и на каких-то закрытых вашобах с результатами вашего труда очень сложно ознакомиться. А, то есть, с одной стороны, это такой, да, open, open source, а, а, сам по себе процессинг, расход, то есть это бесплатные программы, и, но м, то, что многие люди в них делают, в том числе и в архитектурной ассоциации, это такое закрытое какое-то там сообщество, что ли, которое где-то внутри себя живет и очень сложно 
вашим мы увидеть результат, который уже продал. Или, может, мы просто что-то не знаем. Скажите, есть ли какие-то платформы, где вы выкладываете свои наработки и как их можно использовать каким-то другим людям? Well, uh, he asked, uh, well, he said that it's, it's a little bit of contradiction that you build your design on like, open source platforms and it's, uh, it's kind of accessible, but the methodology and the whole body of research which happens around your project, around the design of having the name, for instance, it's very hard to, uh, let's say, get into that from outside, from outside. So if you if you have this idea, if you have this attempt to kind of spread the knowledge, just not invite it to the school, but somehow um, make it more, um, let's say, open, yeah, open source. Okay, so I understood it correctly. And I think you are right, completely. I'm gonna put it all, all free on the internet. <laughs> just saying it now. No, but it's, it's true. I mean, not, not, not all of it. Obviously, there is, there is personal work. I mean, we, we need to differentiate between the tools and what is important to serve, and then the final product. You know, I, I can have maybe the same tools as you have, and we get to generate a really different product. But for example, my students, they, they got my code. They could run it and get my project. And I will put it for free, but we are too lazy with the website. So we are actually working on, on having a, a, a repository for code, so you can download it. Like there is people like Jose Sanchez. Well, Jose was great, because uh, he, he spends a lot of time to actually put the stuff out there. And while he was teaching in the DRL, he was developing these tutorials in the Plethora project and he was actually participating in open processing. I'm just really lazy. Uh, so I don't have time to actually just put everything together and put it out there. But it's true, you're right, and I need to find the time for it. So in my website, at the moment my website, which is this one here, uh, have nothing. It's this one there, okay. I don't have anything about uh, code sharing or any of that stuff. But just because I didn't have time. But I do think it is important. We need to collaborate. We need to share things. I learned a lot when, when I was studying. Rob uh, had uh, his website and he had a few codes there. I use them all the time. I use Sigman. I use, I use Foses. I use a lot of code. And, and now I need to give back. So at the moment, I'm just giving back to my students, unfortunately. And in the workshop, but don't worry. If you don't come to the workshop, I promise you, in a couple of months, whenever I have time to finish this repository, I will get all my stuff out there. I hope to make something better than me with it. That's a requirement. Um, I, think, I think we can ask a question also. Well, if you just continue the conversation, it's not it. I guess he was asking not even about getting certain, like, already pre written uh, uh, parts of your design you can share and somebody can rethink it, but it's kind of make people think the same way you do, which is very com complicated. You cannot really share that while you're not trying it. So, my question was that it was very interesting when you mentioned that, you, that you, there is a certain information embedded into the material which you're trying to read and you're trying to, let's say, uh, rewrite it in your simulation. And my question is, do you have your certain methodology, how you read this information embedded into the material? Because when Ahim Mangalthi was explaining his way of thinking, he starts with simulations with the real material. He's really, really mapping how material behaves and he learning how this happens in the, like, on the chemical, on the structural, other levels. Is that the same way you do? Or you actually don't really bother that if your simulation will, be, have, will have certain tolerance with the real one? 
because uh, when we were showing the last project, that was very interesting because it was about interaction of two materials together, and it's, it's quite interesting. Is that the way you're looking for? You're trying to find this lift between simulation, this information that in your simulation and information, which you probably haven't discovered, but which you added in material, or if. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, yeah, it is definitely what I'm looking for, and no, I don't have any methodology. I'm, I'm going to explain that part. Uh, when I when I started with uh, material material computation, um, I had no idea. Well, I, I knew a little bit of grasshopper, but you know, things not really useful for for material science, right? Like, um, yeah, I don't have the capacity, the technical capacity, to actually get to measure everything. So there is always a certain tolerance. But instead, what, what I did, and I believe what we do a lot in the DRL, for example, uh, is we run a lot of physical tests. We work like crazy. And we run a test after the other. And we run the simulation coupled with it. And at the beginning, there is a huge gap between the physical and the digital. So we just try to approximate and make that gap a bit, a bit kind of smaller and approximate the physical to the digital. So in, the, in our case, I'm just showing like the, you know, the kind of the results of the, the final step of the process, but for example, in the, in the thesis in the digital plastic project, the first experiments with the digital were horrible. They had nothing to do with the real experiments. And the first real, the very first real cast that we got was a balloon. Because we didn't think we need a, a pressure point. Then we thought, oh, it's like a sofa. <laughs> so it's the same. And, and then we started developing. But the first ones were failure. And at the same time, uh, being fa failure, both of the, of the rounds, the digital and the analog, the communication with, uh, between them was really failure. So for me, maybe because I don't have the capacity. I know Mark West, for example, he's much more kind of science-based, and he has all this equipment, and he can test like the deformation of the plaster and things like that, and I would really love to get access to that stuff. But at the moment, just from a designer point of view, I just need to approximate it, because at the end of the day, we will always have to do a material test afterwards. But if I can get to know a little bit of the results before, it would be great. Uh, so what, yeah, what I'm exploring right now is, uh, let's say at the moment I'm, I'm really kind of in the, this last part of it, like more the workshop related and the pavilion. At the moment, that's that's why I call it the sketches. I think those are digital sketches, and it's a way of actually deforming surfaces and things like that. But but I still don't know what's going to happen when you start mixing these materials, and even when you mix people within the behavior of that material, of those materials, right? So I think that's basically why I'm running this workshop and why I'm, I'm trying to build this pavilion, is, is to, to get to see what's the, the distance between the digital simulation and the physical. And if it's really huge, how we can learn from it and implement the digital. So in this workshop, the gap is going to be, I promise you, the gap is going to be huge. Nothing, nothing is going to look like really what we have planned. And we've done that on purpose. But probably in the second one, the gap will be much smaller. So we can cover. It's really test and error. So that's at least the capacity I have. Uh, thank you for the interesting lecture, and uh, it was really nice to see that uh, you're trying to compare somehow uh, architecture with Antonio Gaudi and uh, find maybe some roots uh, in uh, this architecture which goes to a uh, parametric one. Uh, actually, I want uh, to ask you about uh, did you uh, collaborate somehow with uh, Zach Hadid Architects uh, Asymptotes? or maybe other architectural firms. And uh, if so, uh, could you describe uh, the details about the working process, how it was? Thank you. Um, this is going to be totally unexpected. Um, I didn't work for Saab. I think I'm probably the only DRL guy who hasn't worked for Saab. Uh, and instead, I work for Richard Rogers. Really doesn't look like in my work, I know, 
And I learned a lot uh, in there. Um, I think basically because of my interest in the structure, I didn't care so much about maybe styles or maybe I knew the simulation processes before and I I knew I could develop that part in Saha, but somehow kind of I ended up in this other part of the spectrum that was my structural background. It was more from my Spanish kind of background than uh, from what I did in my research work. Um, so that being said, the details about the work, work in progress, um, well, I think you, do, you, need, you need to try one of these, these offices and, and see it, because I can't really explain it. I mean, they, they, I think an office, it depends on the office. Like, I always differentiate between big offices and small offices. Like right now, my office, my own office is tiny. We obviously work completely different than Saha Hadith, right? which is uh, huge. I think it's 600 people, something like that. Uh, but in, at the end of the day, um, it always depends on people. So you will get, maybe, I mean, you get a kind of a common umbrella, Saha Hadith, you know, so you can actually recognize the Saha Hadith project, right? Uh, but then it all, they always get to work in teams, in small teams, uh, 10, 12 people, I mean, I work many people. I know, I know many people. Um, and at the end, it really depends on the project, it really depends on how your project leader is, how they, they deal with the team. No, I don't know. I can, I can tell you though that um, some of the projects that you see today and you see today built, you can't imagine the, the, the iterations that they have been going through. I mean, if, if some of the ideas that has happened in, in, in offices and that has been developed and has been through planning and then at the end it didn't happen, if they would have happened, it would be a disaster. So that I can tell you from almost any office. But yeah, I don't know if, if you have any anything more specific about the work in an office, I can maybe help you or maybe I can speak with you about offices uh, afterwards in the in the drinks and I can get you almost all the details, at least what I can tell. At least from the offices I know. But it's a good experience, you should try it. Question about um, two, two projects that you showed. The last one is a reference of the two dudes in the wall. The you showed the, the uh, two in the space, I think it's called. The performance. Yeah, the performance. Oh. And before that, there was one in San Paulo, you the project you collaborating on with someone. Um, the question is about human interaction, human perception. The uh, rest of the projects you've shown, they, they look like you used the competition, the competition design just purely as an engineering uh, tool. To design. The question is, is computational design for you somehow plausible when it comes to human interaction and human perception? Can that be somehow plugged into the computational model when you design something? Well, again, the, yeah. so your question I think is is about uh, do you clearly differentiate my my kind of two phases? I, I have three, yes, actually, but my kind of two phases. One is the interaction part. And the other one is the, the pure kind of more engineering, more using the algorithm for the structure, right? The question is basically, what do you see in the future of how the computational design, how it's going to go in terms of plugging in human interaction, human perception to the computation in the future? Okay, well, it's going to be I think it's a, it's a good appreciation. Thank you very much. I think I actually always try to orient my lecture to kind of so. That's why I start saying, look, I'm really Spanish, and I'm really Spanish people are really. I mean, we like being. Uh, they normally finish and they, they, they go to build. They work for someone else for one year and then they start their own practice and they start building stuff. Um, British education is not like that. So, for example, I mean, that's something I really like to emphasize in, in the lecture, that is I'm really interested in structure. That's my main interest, maybe it's structures and algorithms, so algorithmic structures. I have this other side, which is this kind of interactive coding and interactive part. Uh, that I really enjoy. If you ask me about what's the future, um, I think, you know what happened? Um, the first time you test something, is it's never successful. And you do too much. So I have the impression that uh, in the beginning of the interactive designs, uh, or for example, like human body interaction with, with machine, right? you have the decoy hypothesis. Right. This is a really good example, it's the surface that kind of responds to 
Well, it doesn't really respond, but it's a, it's a really, really good kind of uh, design piece, and it gives a lot. But the thing is, we, are, we were trying to do too much, to almost have this one-to-one -one relationship, when I touch something and something moves, you know, or something moves and I go back, you know what I mean? It, it was too direct. Or for example, the stuff that we do with Kinect, sometimes it's just, look, I move the hand and this moves. It's a one-to-one -one relationship. And I think, actually, our world, a machine world, is way more complex than that. It's more like Matrix, you know? It's, it's more, it kind of develops its own behavior. It can have that kind of direct communication. So I think, and some of the work that is, is happening now, or is starting to happen, for sure, one of the really good test grounds will be resonate this year. It's always cutting edge on this. And so, in, you know, what's the kind of how is interactive design evolving? It is actually through the communication between the machines themselves and their reaction to the human body, why the human body reacts or communicates with, with itself. So, you know what I, uh, what I mean? So it's almost like two species that somehow get to know each other. There is, a, there is an example that I always uh, like to give, that is uh, Raffaello de Andrea. You know Raffaello de Andrea? He's amazing, a dragon lover. Um, you know the stuff I, I saw, the quadrocopters? He's doing that by, you know, in an amazing level. So he's working in ed and and uh, he's doing now these, these quadrocopters that they cannot fly together. So they self-assemble, they work together, and then they separate. However, when I went to his lecture, right now it's top-down control, so it's centralized. You actually say where the robot is going to be. Because it is really complicated to get them to interact between each other. Like what we did with the quadrocopters, I mean, that was really hard. So you need to actually deploy like learning algorithms and things like that. Um, so somehow right now the technology is catching up that we can give a machine no instructions, but actually a, almost like a book to learn from it and then interpret. Um, so I, I really do think interactive design will have a lot to say when the machines will have a lot to say. Let's, let's leave it there. If that makes sense.